This is the season for a new anointing. This is the season for a fresh outpouring. That the sons and daughters of the King of glory may arise and shine. That the sons and daughters of the King of glory may arise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. In the beginning God created, and for His pleasure all creation sings. Every son and daughter of the King of glory now arise and shine. Every son and daughter of the King of glory now arise and shine as we declare, this is the day, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let your glory fill the earth. Let your glory Welcome, welcome to Twickenham. Glad you are here. Thanks for coming out to be with us today. If you're a guest, we're honored that you've chosen to be here today. Thank you. There's a card in the seat in front of you. You can fill that out. And if you have questions about anything we do or say today, please don't hesitate to ask us about that. If you have prayer requests, you can put those on the card as well. And when the plate passes in just a little bit, you can drop that in and we'll be praying about those as soon as tomorrow. Thank you for uh, last week. I got to take a Sunday off. And um, I just really appreciated that. I got to sit with Lisa through the whole service. Then we went to lunch, and then we criticized the preacher. It was awesome. <laughs> a great day. Really good day. So, so he, he did a good job. That's so, what everybody here does every Sunday. And that's what I know. So it's what I say. I get to do that. So it was fun to get to do that. And now you get to do that today. So anyway. That actually, today is going to be a little heavy. Uh, I'm going to tell you right up front, uh, next week we're starting a, a, an Easter series called Best Story Ever, but this week we're going to talk about a really difficult subject. Uh, we're going to be talking about the, the subject of abortion today, and nothing gory or graphic is going to happen, so you don't need to worry about that, but it could be a really sensitive subject for many of us, so I'm just letting you know ahead of time. We mentioned it a couple of weeks ago that that's what we're going to do today, I'm just reminding you 
that that's where we're headed today. So it'll, it'll feel a little bit heavy at times, but we serve a good God, a God of mercy, grace, and forgiveness, a God who loves each person in this room more than you can possibly imagine. So we're going to live on that today. Uh, in fact, before communion this morning, we're going to have a video testimony of a young woman who experienced the mercy and grace and forgiveness of God uh, in her abortion story. And that'll be a great way to set up our remembering the cross of Jesus. Uh, so be looking for that video. Right now, let's stand. And I want you to hear the word of the Lord from Psalm chapter 8. Listen to this. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. For you have made them a little lower than the angels and have crowned us with glory and honor. Let's return the favor and crown the Lord with the glory and honor of our praises this morning. This is my Father's world and to my listening ears all nature sings and round me rings the Join with 
the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Be seated as we take our offering. I am a sheep and the Lord is my shepherd, watching over my soul. My soul to keep guarding over me ever, watching wherever I go. And when the winds blow, he is my shelter. And when I'm lost and alone, he rescues me. And when the light comes, he is my victory, constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. We are his children and he is our father, watching over our soul. Great is his love for his sons and his daughters. Watching wherever we go. And when the winds blow, He is my shelter. When I'm lost and alone, He rescues me. And when the light comes, He is my victory. Constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. My father was sick growing up. He was a cancer survivor who had a graft versus host disease. And so when I was 10 years old, he passed away. And my mom took care of him, you know, for 10 years. And then a year after my dad passed away, my mother was also diagnosed with um, cancer. Uh, and so she was sick for about three years. Um, and when I was 15, she passed away as well. And so all throughout that time, um, you know, I was going to church, saw how my parents modeled their faith in the Lord, the picture of strength. Um, just leaning on him for everything. When I was a teenager, after they passed away, um, I was really, really angry with God um, and really just sad, and I didn't understand why um, my whole family had been taken away from me. I kind of rebelled against God and said, well, you know, I tried to live life by your rules, and I just kept trying to be good enough so that bad things would stop happening in my life, um, and I could never be good enough. And so I just said, well, whatever, I'm just going to, uh, you know, live the way I want to live. And so... Um, I was dating uh, a young man and fell into a sexual relationship really quickly because he seemed like the only constant thing in my life when everything else was changing. When I was 18 years old, I found out that I was pregnant and had an abortion. That was uh, a really dark time in my life and a decision made out of a lot of fear, fear what people were going to think about me. You know, I was this good Christian girl who had been grown up in church and Everyone just had this image of me as strong, this image of me as a Christian, and I was terrified for that image to shatter the boyfriend um, that I was dating, the relationship that I had, that I had wrapped myself up in, uh, ended. And that uh, was when I finally had nothing else to cling to. There was no Band-Aid, no extra comfort uh, for the pain that I was feeling over uh, the choice that I had made and the loss of, of my child. When I was uh, away at college, I, I would not go to a church. I felt like if I walked into the door, 
immediately everyone was going to know that I was the girl who was having sex with her boyfriend and, and that I had, an, had had an abortion. Um, and I felt like I would have a literal scarlet A on my shoulder. I didn't want anyone to be able to know me uh, because if they didn't know me, then they couldn't hurt me and then they couldn't judge me. When I started going to church again, on the church's website, there was a place for abortion recovery groups. And I had looked at that for about two years before I even attended the church. I keep looking at it, keep looking at it, and finally had the courage to email the woman and met with her. And then I went through the, the study. Even though I had grown up in church my whole life, going through those first chapters on the attributes of God with this new lens of fully understanding the grace of Christ offered to me through the cross uh, was just so instrumental to my healing. I truly understood Christ's death on the cross was for all of my sin, not just part of it. A choice that I thought I would never be able to forgive myself for, never be able to uh, have joy in my life again. He's healed me and he's made me whole again. And uh, knowing how much he values me, just me, even though I've done all these things, even though I have sinned against him, a holy and righteous God, he just loves me and his endless pursuit of me is unfathomable to my mind of uh, why he still continues to pursue me and love me, but he does. Being able to say, I am his child, I am his daughter, I am holy and righteous and redeemed because of Jesus' death on the cross is uh, just about the best news I've ever heard. God, we come to you this morning to remember. We remember that we are all sinners, none lesser nor greater. We are all equal in our sin. And because of that, we come to remember that the sacrifice you made for us truly is an act of love. And when we eat this bread, it reminds us of your body that was given so that we could enjoy the forgiveness that only comes through you. Bless it as we share it to get together today as family. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name and all that agree said, amen.
and he hears me when I call, and he hears me when I call. God, we are grateful that you know each name in this room, that you have known it since the time we were each in the womb, that you listen, that you hear us, and that you shed the blood of your own son on our behalf. May we in our sinful and lost state take great hope and comfort and peace in the blood of Jesus that forgives us and washes us clean forevermore. Bless us as we take this cup. This is our prayer in Jesus' name and all that agree said, amen. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Now I'm no longer.
So we've just been having a lot of conversations lately here at Twickenham about our vision and who God's calling us to be and how we hear that. And uh, one of the things that we have heard from each other, one of the things I've been hearing from a lot of you in these conversations, um, these vision conversations, is that we want to be a church that is really a church about grace. We want to be a people and a community of grace, the kind of church that people will run to, not from, when they are in pain or trouble or confusion. Um, the, kind of, the kind of church where people can bring their stories, however damaged, and still find love. In fact, we, we've, uh, we've got a couple of stories. This is the year of the story, and we've got a couple of stories online, one about a, a man named Joe and one about a woman named Sophia and their families. And they're, um, they are fictional characters, Joe and Sophia, but their stories are real, uh, and we know people like that, and we will know people like that in the next 20 years here in Huntsville. And so we, what, what I've been hearing from you is we want to be the kind of church where Joe and Sophia and people like them and people with those stories can come here and find love and thrive. So you're, you're wanting us to be a place of grace. But then you, another thing that I've been hearing you say is that we also want to be a, a, a people, a church, a community that tells the truth. We, we, want to, we want to be people who will tell each other the things that we need to hear, even if it's the things that we don't want to hear. Uh, we want to be a, a, a place of grace and truth, both. Which sounds a lot like something the prophet Micah said in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He said, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Grace, truth, same thing, right? Well, that's a really compelling passage there in Micah, um, but it's a lot easier to say those things than to do those things because justice and mercy don't always balance out very well. Sometimes what justice requires is the very thing mercy wants to withhold. And it's kind of hard to have strong convictions, to hold strong convictions in a humble spirit. So it's, it's great to say, I want to walk humbly with my God, but then I got all these really strong convictions, and it's hard to do that in a humble kind of way. And that's especially true when we talk about an issue that is as politically polarizing and personally painful as abortion. So let's start with some commitments this morning. Let's, first of all, commit to be the kind of church where we can have hard conversations, uh, where these kinds of conversations are welcome. The culture around us is certainly having this conversation. They're certainly talking about this issue. In fact, they're actually doing a lot more yelling than they are talking and listening. And it's a plot line in uh, the stories that we read, in the movies that we see, in the television programs we watch. It's in the news. Uh, it's in God's Word, too. So if any place should be able to talk about a hard subject like abortion, it should be the church. Any people should be able to talk about it. It should be us. One of the things that I hope you guys get from us older folks is that you can ask hard questions and we can have hard conversations here. Um, not that we're going to have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. Your elders don't have all the answers. Your teachers in your Sunday school classes don't have all the answers. You already know your parents don't already have all the answers, right? Okay. So, but we can have the conversation and together we can work toward answers. And even if we don't get the answer, we get there together. I, I want you guys to know that we can have that conversation. Dr. King once said that our lives begin to end the day we are silent about things that matter. This matters. And so we can't be 
silent. So let's, let's commit to be the kind of church that's willing to have a hard conversation. Because this is not the only one we'll have. There are many other issues that we can talk about. That's the one we're going to deal with today. Second of all, let's, even as we commit to be the kind of church that's willing to talk about hard things, let's commit to talk about them in a fair and honest way. Um, there is just a, when it comes to cultural controversies, it is so easy to fire up Twitter or Facebook or Instagram and go semi-automatic or full-on automatic with a lot of flaming invective and rhetoric, and it's just not helpful. Um, it's easy to demonize people that you disagree with. And social media has certainly contributed to how easy it is to demonize and to write people off, but this is an old problem. It, this, this was, the, the death of civil discourse happened long before uh, social media. In 1804, Vice President Aaron Burr shot former Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton in a duel and killed him, okay? That's a low bar. We can do better, all right? Uh, let me tell you what I mean. People who are pro-choice, who are pro-abortion, are not all Nazis who want to kill babies and sell their parts, okay? They're, they're just not. And people who are pro-life, anti-abortion, are not trying to preserve some male patriarchal hegemony, who are not trying to control women's bodies, are not trying to set up a real-life version of Margaret Atwood's A Handmaid's Tale. Now, I guarantee you that people on the pro-choice side can find people on the pro-life side who would love to live in Margaret Atwood's Gilead. Where the, where the women are controlled completely by the men. They, there are people on the pro-life side who would love to do that. And there are people on the pro-abortion side who really are heinous individuals, okay? But you know what the truth is? Most of us on both sides are just trying to do the best we can to get through life without hurting ourselves or hurting somebody else. We're just trying to find our way. So, Let's not demonize. Let's be fair and honest when we talk about these kinds of things. And while we're at it, let's condemn violence done in the name of Jesus or in the cause of pro-life advocacy. Jesus did not come to bring a sword or a gun or a pipe bomb. And anybody who resorts to that to uh, get rid of somebody they don't agree with does it without the blessing of Jesus or without the blessing of this church that just needed to be said. So um, one more commitment we need to make, and that is that we need to make a commitment um, to mercy, grace, and forgiveness. More than once, well, you guys, you guys are listening better than you ever listened. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Everybody's like, what's he going to say, right? No, we're good. We're, everything's okay. More than once in the last couple of weeks, I've had several of you come to me and say, now, really glad you're doing this, appreciate this, but you know there's probably somebody in that room that's had an abortion. And I, I know that. And I, I appreciate your concern. And, and there's also probably somebody here who paid for one. There's a man here who took his daughter to a clinic or told his partner that the relationship depended upon her getting an abortion. So I understand that. Look, we are not here today. We're not here any day, ever, to stamp a scarlet letter on somebody. There's a passage in Timothy where, where Paul says, I am the worst sinner in the world. Yeah, everybody thinks about when they get to heaven, what they're going to ask people. I'm going to go to Paul and say, I don't know, man. I think I, maybe that was me. You said it, but I'm thinking it was me. My sin, we've talked about that, was not Paul's. Paul's wasn't mine. And neither Paul's nor mine or yours. But every, every person in this room has spiritually crashed it into the wall. Nobody in this room can throw the first stone or the second, or the third, or the fourth. We always wondered, does, does God hear the prayer of sinners? If I've 
committed adultery or had an abortion, will God hear my prayer? Will God hear the prayers of sinners? Well, here's the truth. The only kind of prayers God ever hears are the prayers of sinners. So we're not here to put a scarlet letter on anybody. We're here to embrace mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Now, we, we, we talk about those words a lot, mercy, grace, and forgiveness, uh, and we like them, but we don't, we don't really talk about what they mean or what those words imply, and they have some enormous implications. So the words themselves are not all that complicated. Mercy just means that you're not getting what you do deserve. Okay, that's mercy. I'm not getting, I deserve justice. Okay, the justice of God or the people or my wife or the family or whomever should rain down on me, but I'm getting mercy instead. Grace means that you do get what you do not deserve. Okay, grace can't be earned, it's unearnable. Cannot be earned, it's unearned, and it's unearnable. It's getting what you need, not what you deserve. So, and then finally, forgiveness simply means that your past is not held against you. And we noticed a couple of weeks ago that God wants to lavish mercy, grace, and forgiveness on us. But those words have some implications too, mercy, grace, and forgiveness. We're, this is, we're trying to commit to these words, but they have implications. And one of the implications of those words are is that, well, because we've done something in our past, we need the protection of mercy. They imply that we have drifted so far that we need grace extended to us. And they imply that we have done something for which we need the release of forgiveness. So you can't talk about mercy, grace, and forgiveness without acknowledging the reality and presence of sin. So when we say, I love those words and I want those words for me, what we're saying is, I have done some things that mean I need the protection of mercy, I need the extension of grace, I need the release of forgiveness. We are admitting that there is sin in our lives. So we want to be a church that's willing to have the hard conversation, we want to be fair and honest about it, and we want to be a church that's known for grace forgiveness, and mercy. That's how we're beginning this morning. Here's where we're going. I'm going to make, take the next few minutes and unpack some scriptures for you. And then I'm going to have a pediatrician join me on stage, Dr. Kimberly Dudley, and she's going to be talking with us about the stages of embryonic development, and she'll share a personal story. And then Rick and Laura Segrist are going to join me on stage, and they're going to share their personal story as well. So that's where we're headed. Let's start with a prayer, and then we'll get into it. Let's pray. Great God, Guard the lives and laughter of children. Bring them safely through birth, injury, illness, so that they may live into the promises you give. Do not let us be so preoccupied with our purposes that we fail to honor their lives, to hear their voices, to pay attention to the truth they can teach us. Keep us ready to welcome them. As Jesus said, let the little children come to me, for I'm such as the kingdom of God. Amen. Okay, there are lots of other passages, but I want to just begin by reading three passages uh, to you this morning, um, and then we're going to spend a little bit more time on a fourth passage. The first one's in, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, where God calls Jeremiah to his work as a prophet, and apparently God's plan for Jeremiah was rather long in the making because he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So you kind of wonder, is that just for Jeremiah? Is Jeremiah the only one God knew in his mother's womb? Here's David from Psalm 139, uh, beginning in verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book 
before one of them came to be. And then perhaps the most important verse, a couple of verses in Scripture about the value, the, the innate value of human being. Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, this is verse 26, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all creatures that move along the ground. And so God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. We'll, we'll get into some science in a bit, but I, I want to start with just these amazing scriptures. God says, I formed you in the womb. God says, in the womb, I knew you. David writes, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Your eyes saw my unformed frame. According to scriptures, the beginning of human life is not merely the outcome of biologic processes. God himself forms, knits, knows. God is intimately, immediately, intricately, individually involved in the creation of each human being. For a moment, forget the abortion debate. Think of what that says about you, how you came to be, who brought you into being, your origin, your identity, your destiny, your worth. The same God who made the stars knows your name, knows your heart, knows your story. God himself designed you, engineered you, programmed your personality, breathed into you the breath of life, and you became a living soul. Look around. You are sitting in a room full of divine masterpieces. Each person in this room is a one-of-a-kind, unique, never-before-seen, never-to-be-seen-again, original creation of eternity's greatest artist, and that includes the little people growing in the wombs of the mothers sitting among us. At this very instant, in this very room, God is knitting together a new human, a human being he already knows. And each of us is made in the image and likeness of God, whatever else that means. It means that regardless of your sex, your age, your shape, your size, regardless of your athletic ability, your artistic talent, your aptitude or intelligence, regardless of your Myers-Briggs type, what you see on a Rorschach ink blot or your Enneagram number, Regardless of the color of your skin or the shape of your eyes or the texture of your hair, regardless of your ethnic origin or racial heritage, your physical, mental, or emotional health, health and whether you are spiritually rock solid or confused or lost, whether you believe in God or not, you are a living, breathing image of the eternal God and you have intrinsic worth. But does God really, does, does all that really include the tiny little people growing in the wombs of the mothers sitting among us? So I want you to look at one more passage of Scripture. You're going to unpack this one a little bit more. Exodus 21. Second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, chapter 21, beginning in verse 22. This is the personal injury section of the Law of Moses. I call it the Alexander Shinara section, Okay. Okay, it's, it's, you'll see why. It's what it sounds like. Here we go. If people are fighting and they hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life I don't think this one's up there, this part, this verse is, but it goes on to say, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Okay, so here's the scenario, right? Two men are fighting, and apparently the pregnant wife of one of them tries to get in between the two men who are fighting, and she gets hit, and the, she goes into labor prematurely, is what this, this verse seems to be saying. As it appears on the screen, it, it seems to be saying that the, the intrinsic value of a child who is not born 
is equal to that of a fully developed human being. The fetus in the womb is equal to the value of a fully developed human being. That's what that seems to be saying because it goes life for life, right? Okay, believe it or not, this is a favorite passage for people who are pro-choice, pro-abortion. Why would they be for this? Well, because some versions of the Bible, you're aware that there are different versions of the Bible, right? Different translations. New, New International Version is the one I use the most. There's the English Standard Version that many of us use. There's the Message, the Living Bible, the Old King James Version from 1611. All these different translations of the Bible. And sometimes there are differences in the way passages are translated. Well, some some passages, some translations, some versions of the Bible translate the word in verse 22 differently than the way you see them on the screen right now. Instead of gives birth prematurely, the, New Living, uh, the, the Living Bible, the Message, and some others use the word miscarriage. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she miscarries, okay, that changes the meaning of the passage completely because if you miscarry, the baby doesn't survive. Instead of, and, and so what it seems to be saying, if two people are fighting, if, in, this, in, the, in the Living Bible, if two people are fighting and the woman miscarries, but there's no serious injury to the mother, implied, then the offender has to be fined, pay whatever husband, fine the husband says, right? So it seems to be saying that there's not an equivalence there. The fetus is just not a human being. But if the mother dies, the penalty is life for life. You can see why pro-choice advocates would favor that translation. At issue is the phrase in verse 22. Is it gives birth prematurely or is it miscarriage? Which is it? The original rank language reads this way. It reads literally, uh, if, if people are fighting and they hit a pregnant woman and the child comes forth. That's the original Hebrew. That's what it literally means. The verb for comes forth appears over a thousand times in the Old Testament, over a thousand times. It is never translated miscarriage, not once. The reason that it's never translated miscarriage is because the, the Hebrew already has a different word for miscarriage. And it shows up later, two chapters later in Exodus chapter 23. God promises Israel that if they will worship and obey him, that none of your wives will miscarry or be barren in your land. So Moses had the word if he wanted to use it in his vocabulary, but he didn't use that word in Exodus 21. He didn't use that word because that's not what he was trying to say. The Bible teaches that all people are made in the image of God. The Bible teaches that each person is, therefore, invested with intrinsic value. How you and I treat other people matters because they are made in the image and likeness of God. They are stamped with that divine image. It makes them valuable, intrinsically value, valuable. The Bible teaches that God knows us even when we are in our mother's wombs. And it teaches that a baby in the womb is of equal value to a fully grown adult. Abortion is not simply a choice. It is not simply a medical procedure. It is not only a women's health care issue. Abortion takes a life, a precious image of God bearing human life. If abortion is a part of your story or the part of the story of somebody you love, remember grace, mercy, forgiveness. So far, all we've looked at are some old words in an ancient book. Not everybody's going to be swayed by what the Bible says. This is a science town. So let's talk about some science. I'd like to have Dr. Kimberly Dudley to come on up and join us on the stage. And while she's coming, I want to show you something that the American College of Pediatricians published in an abstract in March 2017. Lynn, can you put that up for us? Here's what the American College of uh, uh, Pediatricians said. Uh, the predominance of human biological research confirms that, yeah, pull that on up, uh, confirms that human life begins at conception fertilization 
At fertilization, the human being emerges as a whole, genetically distinct, individuated, zygotic, living human organism, a member of the species Homo sapiens, needing only the proper environment in order to grow and develop. The difference between the individual in its adult stage and its zygotic stage is one of form, not nature. It's from the American College of Pediatricians in their uh, March 2017 abstract. Fortunately, we have a pediatrician with us today, Dr. Kimberly Dudley. Please welcome her. Give her a hand. And I already opened this, so it won't pop, but that doesn't mean that it's not clean water. Okay, we, okay. We, we always ask this question when we get somebody on stage, okay? Because it's, it's like it's Alabama, right? We got to know. Roll Tide or War Eagle? Go dogs. The other thing that we always do is we always already know the answer to the question before we ask it, okay? So uh, Kimberly and I are like the only two people, I think, in town that are Georgia Bulldog fans, right? Okay, so um, tell us where you went to school, first of all, and uh, did your residency, um, you gotta start off with that. Um, I went to medical school at Medical College of Georgia in Augusta, Georgia, um, and then did, I did- a, Did you play, did you get to play at Augusta? No, I went to the Masters, but okay. I was not right. in them. Um, and then I did residency in Chattanooga, Tennessee at Erlinger Children's Hospital. Okay, Erlinger's a good, good school, okay. So this uh, thing that we read just a second ago uh, from the American College of Pedi Pediatricians mentioned uh, a, a zygote. Mm -hmm. So what, what is that? Kind of give us an idea about what that, what that means. Mm -hmm. so. so a zygote is a one-celled organism formed by the sperm and the egg, and it has 46 chromosomes, 23 from mom and 23 from dad, and it has all the genetic material that you'll ever need for your whole life. Okay, so what's the difference between um, a zygote and a fully developed human being? I mean, I mean if, if it's the same chromosomes, what is mm -hmm. the, what's the difference there? It's basically like they said on there, the form. You know, you look a lot different when you're a zygote and you're one cell, obviously. And the function, you can't do as much, but you're on your way to be able to do that. I heard uh, somebody say that it was the... the um, the size, okay, because mm -hmm. it's one cell, so it's microscopic, maybe not even microscopic, and it may be smaller than that. Um, and uh, the location, right, because mm -hmm. you're seven inches up the birth canal instead of seven mm -hmm. inches down, level of development, and then level of, uh, level of dependency are basically the differences. Is it, so it's the case then that um, everything, there's no, other than size and location and level of dependency, there's no difference between me at 59 and me at the zygotic stage. It's true. 23 from mom, 23 from dad. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So what does it mean when it says that it's a genetically distinct um, creation or, or individual? What does that mean? So it's each parent has two chromosomes of each of their chromosomes, and when you donate one, it's a, you know, a combination every time. That's why no children in your family look exactly the same and things like that. Even if you take identical twins that have the same you know, genetic makeup, different genes are turned on, so you can still have little differences. That's why my sister's so weird, right? <laughs> Probably. Probably. Okay. She's listening online, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> 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 so tell me a little bit about how, uh, how you know the development of, okay we got this one celled zygote i don't want us to get too deep in the weeds here because you're going to know way more than we can handle but what kind of what are the stages of development uh, the fetal development we, we when do we hear heartbeat and when do we see brainwave activity and limbs and facial features and all that other stuff so so I want to preface it by saying that if you go to the doctor, they tell you, you know, that you're five weeks pregnant or however far along you are, but actually that's always two weeks ahead of conception. So usually at the 20-week ultrasound, like the baby is really just 18 weeks. So the weeks that I'm going to use are from conception, so specific to the baby. Um, the heartbeat can be detected 22 days after conception, which is why it's usually at the five-week visit. Um, eyes by week five, you have the beginning of retinas. What, heartbeat, 22 weeks? 22 days. 22 days. Yes, okay. after yeah, conception. 22 days. Okay, so I'm, I, I'm, I've never been pregnant, but I'm going to guess that mm -hmm. most people don't know they're pregnant even at that point, right? Right. Or a lot of people don't, five mm -hmm. weeks. Okay, Okay. go ahead. Go ahead. 
Um, from two days. Eyes start about week five, the beginning of the retinas form. By seven weeks, you have eyelids. By week 14, the eyes start moving. And by week 26, the eyelids can open. By week 26? Mm -hmm. By week 26, okay. That used to be about viability, too, didn't it? Was it 26 weeks? The viability is mm -hmm. um, the ability of the child to survive outside the womb, is that? Right. Okay. Now it's pretty well accepted at 22 weeks. Um, occasionally you get a 21-weeker that survives, but... Um, What's the youngest you've ever had? 22 weeks. 22 weeks, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I had actually an attending in residency that... She's 40 years old now, but she was born at 26 weeks 40 years ago, and now she has a little bit of asthma, and she wears contacts, but otherwise, she's a doctor. So, yeah. um, I'm going to go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What else? Okay. What else? So, um, week six, the outside of the ears form, and by week 16, the baby can hear. Um, by week 16, mm -hmm. the baby can hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. And at, at that point, in, mo in a lot of states, you can still, I mean, that's first trimester, right? It's a second. second trimester, mm -hmm. okay. So, okay, go ahead. Um, the nose, uh, by week six, that's fully formed. The mouth starts in week six and ends by about week 10. Um, as far as your limbs go, your arms are always pretty much a week ahead of your legs. So, by week four, you have small buds that will become your arms. Um, and then fingers begin to form in week six. And again, everything's about a week later for the legs and toes and all that. Um, by week 10, you have fingernails, and by week 15, you have toenails. Um, I'm going to go into the, what they can do. Yeah, that, uh, the, you, you talk about how they respond to things. Yeah, mm -hmm. I want to hear that. Yeah. Okay, so um, by week 7, brain waves can be detected. Um, this is kind of the activities that the baby does before they're born. By week 11, they're practicing swallowing amniotic fluid, and they make urine, and then they drink it again, and we all did too. Um, <laughs> Some of them still do, so. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not. We've had children, so. And then uh, week 18 is usually um, mom can feel movement by then called quickening, um, and the baby can be awakened by noises or by mom's movements, which is kind of neat. Uh, week 19, you can catch them thumb sucking sometimes at that point and onward. By week 21, they can get the hiccups. Um, and then by 27 weeks, they can kick, stretch, and make grasping movements, like to try to grab their cord and things like that. Um, by 32 weeks, they practice breathing. They don't need to breathe at that age because they get all of their oxygen, you know, oxygenated by mom's lungs and delivered by the cord. But How do they, they practice do breathe. breathing? Just they, the liquid? The well, amniotic fluid? Or? They're just opening, expanding their lungs, you know. So they're trying they to get ready. Okay. Surfactant by then, which keeps them open. Yep. So, um, I know that in a lot of states, like New York and, and Virginia, and I think Pennsylvania is leading this way too, they're talking about third trimester abortions. And so what we're seeing then is these children are, these babies are, are able to do a, a lot of stuff. I mean, they're past viability in many cases here. So right. you have a personal story. I do. Um, let's see. Kind of wrote it out because I didn't want to forget anything. So, can we, Lynn? Can you put up the, the? There we go. These little footprints. Tell me about those footprints. So, anybody that knows me knows that I have a two and a half year old nephew, Connor, and he's pretty much my favorite little person in the whole wide world. He's the one, the only competition Robert has to worry about. Um, so, we were really excited at Thanksgiving to find out that my sister was pregnant again. Um, she went on February 20th, just over a month ago, for their 20-week ultrasound, and they actually found out there that the baby had passed away about two weeks earlier, they thought, so around 18 weeks of pregnancy or 16 weeks of development for the baby. Um, they induced her the next day, and she gave birth to my nephew. They didn't know what he was going to be, you know, at the appointment the day before, but it was a little boy. Um, he weighed 10 ounces, and he was eight, almost eight and a half inches. Those are his little footprints up there on an eight and a half by 11 uh, standard size paper. Um, like I said, it was a boy. They hadn't really thought about names yet, but after the fact, they knew that it was important to give him a name. 
So they ended up naming him Charlie Matthew Johnson. Charlie means strong man, and Matthew means gift from God. Um, I got to go to Chattanooga after work that night and hold him, and that was really special to kiss his little head, tell him I love him, and that I'd see him in heaven one day. Um, but I think, you know, one thing that we talked about was life is held with such little regard this day and age, so it's really, you know, important and special to be able to acknowledge his and recognize his. And even though it was a day, obviously, that my sister especially dreaded having to go to the hospital and give birth to their baby that you knew wouldn't be alive, it was also a gift to be able to hold him because a lot of people don't get to, you know, when it happens even earlier. Um, but one thing that she had said, too, was that even though something had happened and something had gone wrong for him not to make it, you know, um, what a miracle it still was, because even at, you know, 10 ounces, he had, uh, he had a like, cute little nose and a tiny little mouth, and he had all, all of his fingers and toes and fingernails and toenails, and his proportions weren't quite what ours are, obviously, but you could tell that, you know, he was a little person. And how many weeks was he? He was uh, 16 weeks 16 for him, weeks. 18 weeks into pregnancy. Um, but it was kind of like your uh, sermon title. You could, he was fearfully and wonderfully made, for sure. So. Uh, we sent, uh, the Dudleys actually made a donation to uh, our recent Hacienda for Hope in Charlie's honor. Uh, so it was very special for that. Kimberly, thank you for sharing all of the science with us. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. So I want to have a, a, another family come join us here. This is Rick and Laura Segrist, and they're going to come up and share a personal story as well. Um, give them a hand and welcome them. This is good. This is good. Thank you. I don't think she drank out of that one, but just in case. <laughs> She's a doctor. She's real clean. So. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I'll ask you guys the same question. Uh, is it Roll Tide or War Eagle? Roll Tide. War Eagle. Oh, wow. <laughs> Actually, we have a picture. Uh, can we see that, that first picture there, Lynn? There we go. That so, almost convinced him. Yeah, almost, almost convinced him, but not quite. So you're no. holding a Crimson Tide football. I'm a Gene Stallings fan. Okay. <laughs> okay you guys have something more than just uh, football in, in, in common with... Coach Stallings, why don't yeah. you tell us what that is, Laura? Uh, Coach Stallings had a son, John Mark. Oh, this is going to be terrible. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Take another Xanax. Yeah, right? I should have brought an extra. Um, he had a son, John Mark, who had Down syndrome and just was the love of his life. And a couple years ago, we got to um, go to that dinner and meet him. And he met John Isaac. And at first, he didn't even, you know, he was just like, oh, a cute baby. And um, I think that the picture was um, after I had told him, you know, that his book, Another Season, was the only thing Rick read after we got our diagnosis um, at 14 weeks that he was going to have Down syndrome. That was the only encouraging thing that Rick read about it. And so, you know, at first he was like, well, that baby doesn't have Down syndrome. I said, yeah, he does. And... He took them from me, and I didn't know if I was going to get him back or not, because he just, like, cuddled just in and loved on John talked Isaac. to him. And, yeah. that, and that didn't convert you to Roll Tide at all? Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> but he does like Coach Stallings. So. Yeah, I've seen him. He's a good guy. He is. Yeah, very. Tell us about uh, how, you, how you got the news, um, where you were. <laughs> um, it, it was brutal. Um, so I was 40 when we found out I was pregnant with him, and I went to my regular OB for my eight week to hear the heartbeat and everything, you know, and I made a joke with her um, if I could be a high-risk pregnancy again, because our first pregnancy was identical twins. We just hit the genetic jackpot over and over, but uh, our, my first pregnancy was identical twins, and they um, are high risk of developing certain um, conditions and everything, so I had to go see the high-risk doctor for them, and then I ended up with preeclampsia. So when I made the joke, you know, can I be high-risk again? Because you get a gazillion ultrasounds when you're high-risk. Um, a regular pregnancy, you don't get, like, two. And I like ultrasounds. Um, 
I just like to see the baby, you know, developing. It's cool. But uh, so I made the joke. She was like, well, funny, you're old, so you are high risk, <laughs> you know. So um, I went to see Dr. Gonzalez. That was our maternal fetal medicine doctor uh, for the girls. And so I saw him again. And our first meeting, they did an ultrasound. Everything looked good. And I was 12 and a half-ish weeks at that point, And they did blood work. And I thought it was the fancy blood work that tells you early if you're having a boy or a girl. And I did not really realize everything they checked for with that blood work. And so a couple days later, as I'm driving down 565, I get a phone call from a nurse. And she says, um, you know, that she identified herself as a nurse for Dr. Gonzalez. And she said, I'm sorry, but you're blood work came back, that you're, um, God, this is going to be terrible, okay. <laughs> that you're high risk for um, having a baby with trisomy 21. Trisomy? Trisomy 21. Trisomy 21. Which I had no idea what that meant. And um, so, like I said, I'm driving down 565, and I'm just trying quick to get off the road. because the research park. Yeah. Um, I took the research park exit and pulled over to the side of the road, and She's telling me, you know, you can come in. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez does three days in Birmingham where his home office is and two days here. So this was on a Thursday. So she said, we're holding an appointment for you in the morning um, in Birmingham if you can come. Fast. Very fast. Um, she said, or you can wait till next Tuesday when he's back in Huntsville. And, you know, my head's spinning. I have no idea what's going on. And so I'm just on the side of the road and then... I was like, I just got to talk to talk to Rick, you know, and um, finally towards the end of the phone call, you know, I was just like, I don't, what, what is trisomy 21, you know, and she said, well, it's Down syndrome, and all I could think of was, oh, it's not the bad one, <laughs> because there's all these other trisomies that kids can get that are not survivable, and so. So your sense that, was, oh, good. Right? Like, oh, yeah. fantastic, you know, this doesn't necessarily mean fatal, even though that's kind of how it was presented, but. I'm trying to get a hold of Rick, can't get a hold of him, and then this big white suburban pulls oh, in front of me. At the end of the phone oh. call, you oh. finally found out. Yeah, at the end of the it, phone it call, I said, well, so is it a boy or a girl? And she was just like, it's a boy. And that was kind of that. And so then I start trying to call Rick, and this big white suburban pulls in front of me, and then all I can think is, leave me alone. I am not having car trouble. Go away, because I am a hot mess. And uh, then my phone rings, and it was Jennifer Segrist. And I can't look out there and our, find her, because I'll cry. One of our members here. Yeah. No relation. And, uh, no, no yeah, relation. No relation. Yeah. Except but, in Christ. Yes. But uh, she called, and, she was, and then that's when I realized it was her that had pulled in front of me. And she was like, what's going on? Are you okay? And I was like, no, I'm not. And she had John Luke with her, which he was just, I don't know, probably six or seven months old at the time. So she was like, John Luke's in the car. Come get in the car. So I run up there, you know, and finally got a hold of Rick. And we decided we would do the um, test the next day in Birmingham, or that we would go to Birmingham. Um, so jumping ahead a little bit, all that night, after we started reading about things um, and about the tests they were going to do, it does increase your risk of miscarriage. Um, and so I did not want to do it at all. Um, I started praying and prayed all night that they would see something on the ultrasound because there are certain markers that they can look for. And um, so we went and had the appointment, and they didn't see any markers at all. Um, not, even mm -mm, not even close. Not even close. And so uh, Dr. Gonzalez asked, did we want to go ahead with it? what I had was called the, uh, it's the CVS, chorionic villus sampling or something like that. Um, after 16 weeks, you can have an amniocentesis, which is when they insert the needle and take out the amniotic fluid to test. But since I was only 13 weeks, um, they did the CVS, and that's they actually insert a needle into the placenta um, and take cells and test those. And so... He just kind of went over everything and um, asked if we want to have it, and I just still wasn't Ask sure if, wanted if we test. wanted to have the test. Okay. That would be the diagnostic instead right. of just the screening. And um, I just I asked him. I said, "Did you see anything on the ultrasound that makes you think that he wouldn't survive it?" 
And he said, if I saw anything that made me think that, I wouldn't offer to give you this test. Mm. And so I appreciated that. And then he left us alone and we talked about it and decided finally, you know, with my anxiety through the roof already, it would be better to know so we could start just preparing. And we told them, you know, that it wasn't going to change anything, you know, that we, we were going to have, we were gonna have this baby, right. you know. And so um, we had the test done. The, t the results were to come in on Monday, and no one ever called. And um, I called to see if they were in yet and talked to a nurse. And um, I asked her, I said, you know, when, when can I relax? Like, when is that window of the chance of miscarriage over? Like, and she was like, if you were, it would have been on Friday. So you can relax about that. And I said, okay, good. Because I would have liked to have known that on Friday, <laughs> you know, <laughs> instead of spending all weekend, like, nuts. But um, anyways, she asked a couple of questions that were beating around the bush to find out where we were. Um, as far as if About. we were going to continue the pregnancy or terminate. And so I just, I came out and said, do you have any resources for being pregnant with a child with Down syndrome? Because we're not She's terminating. Yeah. It'll yeah. be a good thing to lead with. And yeah. so it wasn't until I asked that we even got the one tiny little booklet that they gave us, but it was not much. But I'm an oversharer on Facebook, so <laughs> I posted a big long thing that night. Then You're not alone. Yeah, I know, right? Um, but, uh, oh, well, then when they called with the results of the diagnosis, I was at a toy store with my twin three-and-a-half-year-olds, and it was Dr. Gonzalez, and he didn't start with, I'm sorry, which was good, um, he, but he said the, the test came back, and it's confirmed that he'll have Down syndrome. And so that was the fastest I've ever paid at a toy store, because then I'm trying to shuffle them out, and... I think I told the clerk there what had just happened, <laughs> and you know, sorry, I don't know your name, but my baby's gonna have Down syndrome. The girls didn't even know you were expecting it. Yeah, I don't think we had even told them yet. And then, um, oh yeah, they did, because that's the first day they picked out a little levy for him. Okay. And then, um, We I, do marriage counseling too sometimes, Yeah, so. <laughs> we, we need to sign up. But, um, <laughs> that's next week, right? Yeah. Um, but, Anyways, so then I get a hold of him, and we get over to my parents' house, and, you know, I post that night, and within five minutes, I had friends that I had not talked to since high school messaging me, hey, my cousin in Madison has a five-year-old with Down syndrome. They're really involved in bringing up Down syndrome or BUDS, which is a big support group here. So we were plugged in really quickly with a lot of support and um, luckily provided a lot of resources. We actually have a, a picture of um, John Isaac's chromosomes. Can we, can we there we go. Yeah. Uh, fourth line down, third over, you see the three, is that right? Yeah. Okay, there's the, yep. there's the extra chromosome. And can we get a shot of the, <laughs> Laura has some ink here, and this is John Isaac's, is this 21st? 21st, yep. 21st chromosome with the three. Yep. <laughs> It's three the, copies. The three copies. So, mm -hmm. you, Rick, how did, what, what's the hard part of, of this and what's the blessing in this? Well, uh, before he got here, I was pretty devastated. I, I don't cry much, but I cried for like a solid week. And I had so many things going through my mind that just all kinds of thoughts. Like, you know, I'm embarrassed to admit now, but I was afraid I wouldn't bond with the him or love him in the same way I love the girls, which turned out to be not at all the case. Um, it's changed. So when, when he got here, I saw him as a person and not as a syndrome. Before he got here, I'd just been reading about all the history of Down syndrome. And the, which is really the, depressing. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was not helping. No. And, uh, but knowing him and the girls knowing him, I think it changes the way you value people. Um, you know, I'd always looked up to people who were smart and good artists and good writers, but now I see um, he's able to love people at, at age three in a, in a unique way, and um, I, I don't look, my, I think my girls see that um, we love him in spite of his imperfections, so that's reassuring to them, I think. Um, 
and they are fiercely defending him at school and <laughs> are proud that he has Down syndrome and will tell everybody they meet and um, want to take on any bullies that he might come across. Yeah. <laughs> what, what are you afraid of? Uh, I'm afraid of a lot less than I was, but I'm still, I see the way the world sees Down syndrome as I think people see it as be, being a defective person and that's not at all the way I, I think, see it. I think, in fact, uh, Europe, Scandinavian countries, worldwide, the reason we're talking about Down syndrome in a conversation about abortion is because they're really the primary targets of abortion, yes. right? Yeah, in the United States, the statistics are something like 67% of pregnancies that receive a prenatal diagnosis are terminated. Um, Scandinavia, it's in the 90s. I think worldwide, it's like 92%. 92% mm -hmm. children the, diagnosed with Down syndrome are, are terminated. Yeah. Gone. And then 67% numbers going up as they get more and more t genetic testing. Because well, they're starting to give the tests earlier and to everyone, not just women who are of advanced maternal age. Okay. <laughs> One of the, when we talked last week in the office, I asked you guys a question. I gave you a scenario. A woman comes to you or a man comes to you. We're pregnant. And they say, and we've been told that our child is going to have Down syndrome. And you responded the same way. Congratulations. Congratulations. It's a boy. Yeah. It's a girl. Okay. Yeah. Welcome to the club. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Appreciate y'all coming up here and joining us. Okay, I've got one more thing I want to show you. I, I've got a personal story, too. Lynn, if you could put this last picture up. The cherubic figure you see on the left, <laughs> that angel, is me. The, the little guy in the middle is my middle brother who looks like he's either got caught doing something wrong or has seen what you people are hiding on the arsenal, okay? <laughs> and then the... The little girl really can't see it very well. Uh, her hands are up here like this. Uh, one of the early signs we noticed, that my family noticed about my sister Jean was that she couldn't close and open her fists. And she just kind of kept them in that position. You can't see it, but my mother is behind the three of us holding Jean up because she is unable to sit on her own. And she never really got there. Jean never walked a step. She never spoke a word. She never put a bite of food into her mouth. My mother changed her diapers. I estimated once around 75 to 80,000 diapers mom changed in the course of Jean's 42, Euro, 42 years on the earth. And um, that was cloth diapers, okay? Not the fancy pampers stuff we have now. So my sister would have been aborted by many people had they known she was in that condition. But what I want to tell you is that that little girl, put, put that back up there one more time for me, Lynn, that little girl taught me more about unconditional love without ever saying a word than anyone ever has or ever will. She not only taught me about justice and mercy and forgiveness and love, she equipped me and my siblings so that not only are we comfortable with people who have developmental disabilities. We are equipped to, to, to be a part of their lives. And it's not just me and my brother and, and the other two siblings that are not in that picture there, the ones that came later. It's our children and my nieces and nephews, both of my boys, Lisa's boys, and all of our nieces and nephews on that side of the family who grew up with Aunt Jean. Not only have they had friends who had developmental disabilities, but they have worked with them, and some of them are even making it a career. My, my sister, who never spoke a word, walked a step, kissed a boy, went to school, or as far as we know, had a rational thought of any kind, has set people on a life journey where they will be blessing others until the day they die. My sister had intrinsic value because she was made in the image of God, and God knew her name from the beginning. Thank you for listening. We're going to stand. We're going to sing one more song, and then we'll have a, a closing prayer.
We're not singing. Stay oh, here. We're not going to sing? Okay. Let's pray. God, thank you for uh, Jody, for his honesty and his humility, for his passion, for the way that he cares about important things. Thank you for the blessing of witnessing the glory of your name this morning, for seeing the glory of your name in birth and in life, for realizing and remembering again just how important and precious it is. May we leave here being renewed, being made new, being born again because of your spirit that lives within us and because of your love for us that you've shown us through Jesus Christ. And may every day that we walk this week be a blessing. This is our prayer in Jesus' name and all the degrees said. Amen. Have a great week.